This appears to be an innocent home video of a happy couple, Paul Bernardo and Carla Homolka. But in an adjoining room is 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. Before the night is out, she'll be brutally murdered and thrown into a lake. Her body is discovered one year later. Paul stands trial for her murder and that of another teenager, Kristen French. We love you, Kristen. And we are constantly in our thoughts and our prayers. But Carla is not on trial with him. Nobody died before Carla got involved. But was justice really served? This is the incredible case of the Ken and Barbie killers. Homolka grows up in a normal, stable, and happy family in Ontario, Canada. The eldest child of three, she's pretty, smart, and popular at school. At the age of 17, she falls in love with 22-year-old Paul Bernardo. He's a hard-working junior accountant with a bright future. Bernardo proposes to Homolka on Christmas Eve, 1989. In the summer of 1991, 21-year-old Homolka marries 26-year-old Bernardo in a fairy tale wedding in historic Niagara on the lake. No expense is spared. Homolka and Bernardo appear to be the perfect couple. Until January 4th, 1993, when Carla Homolka walks into her local police station in St. Catharines, Ontario, with two black eyes. The next day, she files charges against her husband for domestic assault. Police in Toronto hear of the charges. They're intrigued because since mid-1987, there have been 14 rapes or attempted rapes 70 miles away in Scarborough, Toronto. Bernardo is once interviewed by police because his face matches a sketch of the suspect, but fails to rouse further suspicion and is eliminated from their investigation. Fueled by news of the assault charge, police decide Paul Bernardo is worth a closer look. Homolka is scared because she's hiding a terrible secret. I think that with the police coming around to investigate her and her relationship with Bernardo, she was afraid that they might stumble on something. Two teenage girls have gone missing within the last year. One is 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. The other is 15-year-old Kristen French. Kristen, if you were to hear and read this, you want to know that we are thinking of you and that everything can be done, is being done. And we'll get you back real quick. But the two girls are found dead. Kristen's body in a ditch. 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey's in a lake. Homolka's secret is that she knows what happened to them and it involved her and her husband. Homolka's fear is that if her husband is implicated in their killing, then she too can be charged with aiding and abetting him. It's a crime that could carry a life sentence. So she calls an attorney in her hometown of St. Catharines for help. He decided to trade the information that she had on a two very high profile homicides for some degree of immunity, if not total immunity. 
Homolka tells her attorney that Bernardo has murdered the girls, and he forced her to help him. To avoid her facing life in prison for murder, her attorney proposes a plea bargain. She would plead guilty to manslaughter in relation to each of Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French for five years apiece, total 10 years. And um, on the condition that she would tell 110% of the truth to the police and would testify and so on and so forth. Homolka agrees to tell the police everything and promises to give evidence against her husband. The police then search their home but find nothing. So, based solely on her confession, Paul Bernardo is arrested and charged with kidnapping, rape, and murder of 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey and 15-year-old Kristen French. On July 6, 1993, Homolka is convicted of two counts of manslaughter and sentenced to just 10 years in prison, as had been agreed. The press are banned from reporting the plea bargain hearing. Bernardo is held in jail, awaiting trial for murder. He waits two years. Meanwhile, in September 1994, John Rosen becomes Bernardo's defense attorney. But as he begins to study the case, he makes an alarming discovery. I was very upset. I was so upset, I excused myself. I went into the bathroom, got myself together, and I said, okay, that's the way it is, that's the way it is. In the case against Paul Bernardo, his defense team discovers shocking videotapes of him and his wife, Carla, torturing their teenage victims. The tapes leave no doubt that Bernardo, at the very least, is a savage rapist. Could I get Mr. Bernardo off completely? Not in light of those tapes. From the tapes, the jury would quickly conclude that he was one of the abductors that he unlawfully confined, that he sexually assaulted each of the girls. So Rosen prepares an unusual defense. He'll argue that although Bernardo may have done terrible things, the girls were only murdered because of Homolka. Nobody died before Carla got involved. Carla was involved, Leslie died, then Kristen, okay? If he can convince the jury that it was Homolka who was behind the murders, he'll tell them they must reduce the first-degree murder charge against Bernardo. And there is a possibility that he could be found guilty of second-degree or manslaughter. So while I was not in a position to work towards a complete acquittal, I was in a position to, um, uh, to try and get a lesser uh, charge at the end of the day, or lesser conviction. On May 18, 1995, the trial of Paul Bernardo begins here at the Toronto Superior Courthouse. The families of his two victims, 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey and 15-year-old Kristen French, attend court every day. Paul Bernardo has been charged with two counts of first-degree murder, two counts of unlawful confinement, two counts of kidnapping, two counts of aggravated sexual assault, and one count of causing an indignity to a human body. To each of the nine charges, Bernardo stands and replies in a loud, clear voice, not guilty. Everything would now depend on whether John Rosen could prove Homolka instigated the murders. I had to actually demonstrate that for the jury as to how unreliable she was and ultimately put her in a position where I could, um, with good authority, put to her that she's the actual killer. Eric Broadhurst would be one of the 12 members of the jury Rosen would have to convince. He vividly remembers the first time he saw Paul Bernardo in the courtroom. He was filled with confidence, tall, blonde-haired, 
good looking, physically fit, blue piercing eyes, and uh, very aloof. I think from day one, he figured he was gonna get out of this. Key to the trial will be the interpretation of the content of the videotapes. The prosecution will argue that the tapes show Bernardo is the killer. But the defense believes their confidence is misplaced. They began on the presumption that, that he was so evil and so bad that it was a slam dunk. And uh, it wasn't. The prosecution opens their case against Bernardo by playing the tapes, frame by frame, in open court. At first, it seems the videos are nothing more than homemade pornographic movies, the stars of which are Bernardo and Homolka. As the tapes play on, other characters appear who are restrained, clearly in pain and suffering, and forced to endure humiliating abuse. The victims are easily identifiable as 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey and 15-year-old Kristen French. While their deaths are not on the tapes, brutal violence is, including the sexual assaults. It proves more than the victims' families could bear. Analysis of the tapes takes weeks. The first person to be questioned about their content is Carla Homolka. She's the prosecution's witness, so they begin by attempting to portray her as just another one of Bernardo's victims. A victim who is forced into watching rape and murder by her husband. But you know what? She did cry a number of times, but she was very composed, and she handled herself extremely well. John Rosen's task is to undermine her claims in his cross-examination. I ha had to break her down in terms of credibility. I had to demonstrate that she was no victim, that she was a perpetrator. What follows is a classic courtroom confrontation. Rosen's aim is to remind the court who the real victims are. I said, here's Per Kristen, dead, clean, washed, and dead. Right. I said, you're no victim. After nine days on the witness stand in her husband Paul Bernardo's murder trial, Carla Homolka's testimony comes to an end. Bernardo's attorney now gives the court his account of what really happened to Leslie Mahaffey and Kristen French in 1991. The defense claims Bernardo only intends to kidnap and rape, and the idea of murder is always Homolka's. The first victim, Leslie Mahaffey, is abducted, and then, crucially, Rosen argues, she's blindfolded by Bernardo before being raped. He just came across her and decided on a spur of a moment to kidnap her and use her as a sexual toy. Um, so he, and he blindfolded her so she wouldn't see him, which again lends credence to the fact that he intended to let her go. Rosen claims everything changes when Homolka removes the blindfold something she denies doing. But now Leslie can identify her abusers. They'll have to kill her. After 24 hours of rape and abuse, Mahaffey is strangled, Rosen claims, by Homolka. Again, something she denies. And according to Rosen, Carla Homolka takes charge of destroying any evidence. There was a decision to dispose of the body by sawing her up into pieces. Carla was there with the tarp, and Carla scrubbed that basement floor to make sure there wasn't one shred of Leslie Mahaffey in that house, and the police never found anything. Homolka denies this allegation, too. Rosen moves on to say how he believes their second victim, Kristen French, is killed. Homolka and Bernardo stalk her and abduct her as she walks home from school. They take her back to their house and hold her captive. Kristen French was this naive young girl in a, in a private Catholic school who'd been scooped off the street by both of them, and that was, that was horrible enough. Homolka videotapes Bernardo raping Kristen before joining in the rape and abuse herself. 
and then to be subjected to gross indignities during the course of the sexual assault. And, uh, but a very, very, very strong and feisty little girl. Despite putting up a determined fight, Kristen French is savagely abused over the course of three days and then suffocated. And yet again, Rosen argues that it's Homolka who takes charge of destroying the evidence. Though yet again, she denies it. She had been uh, showered and washed and all the forensic evidence gone. And that was all Carla. That was Carla was wanted to make sure they didn't get caught. She made sure that things were cleaned up and so forth. And so from that view of the evidence, I took the position he wasn't the killer. Throughout the trial, Homolka denies being a willing accomplice, insisting she too was a victim. After 18 weeks of argument, everything depends on whose account the jury believes, Homolka's or Bernardo's. On August 31st, the jury is sent out of the court to consider their verdict. When we were dismissed to reach a verdict, it took us one and a half days, the second day, and we had reached a verdict unanimously, the 12 of us, on all nine charges against Paul Bernardo. It was unanimous and he was guilty on each count. Two weeks later, 31-year-old Paul Bernardo is sentenced to 25 years in prison, though in Canada, he's considered a dangerous offender, which means it's unlikely he'll ever be released. But Bernardo's sentence is not the end of the story. Only after the trial is finished, as the media blackout is lifted, does the press and public begin to learn about Homolka's plea bargain. One chilling story emerges that casts doubt on Homolka's claim that she is just another of Bernardo's victims. Just after Paul Bernardo's sentencing, a disturbing story involving him and Carla Homolka is revealed. On Christmas Eve 1990, six months before Carla and Paul marry, her sister Tammy, aged 14, is found dead having choked on her own vomit. At the time, it's thought it's just a tragic accident. But during her secret plea bargain hearing, Carla Homolka reveals that her death is anything but. She was also a participant in the death of her sister Tammy Homolka not in circumstances that amounted to murder, uh, but circumstances that amounted to manslaughter, still a homicide, an unlawful killing. 14-year-old Tammy Homolka develops a schoolgirl crush on her sister's fiance, but she has no idea that Carla has promised him her virginity. So that night, Carla plies Tammy with champagne. Tammy soon becomes incapacitated and while Homolka keeps her drugged on the anesthetic halothane, Bernardo rapes her throughout the night. They hadn't planned on killing her, but the drunken, defenseless teenager chokes on her own vomit. Homolka tries to revive her, but fails. So the two of them clean up the mess and make it look like an accident. Carla reveals her part in the manslaughter of her sister only after the plea bargain is agreed. But rather than cancel the deal, Canadian authorities accept Homolka's confession and extend her sentence by just two years. None of this information is made available to the court at Bernardo's trial. I don't fault them for making the deal. Uh, I know other people do. But at the time that the deal was made, they had no evidence against either of them. They didn't even know that they were involved. Shortly after the trial, Homolka and Bernardo's house is demolished before a crowd of grateful neighbors and an emotional Debbie Mahaffey, the mother of their victim, 14-year-old Leslie Mahaffey. 
when this house comes down, it comes down for all victims in my mind, everywhere. That's why I wouldn't like throw. I wouldn't mind throwing a brick and seeing if I couldn't hit that top window. When Carla Homolka is released from prison on July 5th, 2005, after serving her 12 years, she doesn't return to her hometown, but is given a new identity and moves over 300 miles away to the city of Montreal. She lives anonymously until she's eventually tracked down. Hi. Carla, can I ask you a question? Do you have anything to say to us? Nothing. A lot of people in your neighborhood don't like, the f don't like the fact that you're living here. Anything to say about that? How's, how's your last year been in Montreal? Homolka later leaves Montreal and now lives on the Dutch Antilles Islands in the Caribbean. Her ex-husband, Paul Bernardo, is likely to die in prison. But for some involved in the case, one question remains. Did Homolka get off too lightly? She served the full, complete 12 years and is now free as a bird and is married and has a child, but she got away with it.